And we're starting a brand new series in the book of Romans called More Than Conquerors, Finding Hope in the Gospel. Um, the theme verse for this series is also the same verse that we have as our theme verse for our school, and it's found in Romans 8, 37. Paul is building his way all the way to Romans chapter 8 to some awesome truth. So go ahead and put Romans 8, 37 up on the screen, and I want us all to say that out loud together. Are you guys ready? Here we go. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. There's an incredible truth in that verse. We're not only conquerors, we're more than conquerors. Now, when I first mentioned this new series um, and, and I started getting out there, one of the first people that I mentioned it to stopped and asked me a really great question. What does it mean to be more than a conqueror? I mean, how is it possible to be more than a conqueror? Well, before Paul gets to this verse in Romans 8, 37, he himself asks a great question in verse 35. So go ahead and put Romans 8, 35 up on the screen. And here's the question that Paul asks. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Man, let that, let that sink in there for just a second. That, this is a great question that we all must answer in our own lives. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Then look what he says, and you all help me out here. Shall or 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 Paul must be a preacher. He throws in lots of extra adjectives along the way. The point is he understands life, Right? He understands that, that we are faced with all kinds of trials and temptations and struggles. And it doesn't matter what we're faced with. It doesn't matter what we're going through. It doesn't matter how impossible the odds seem or they feel. Do you understand the answer to the question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, persecution, is there anything in this world that can cause us to succumb to ultimate defeat? And he says in verse 37, nay, no way. In all these things, whatever it is that you're faced with, we aren't just conquerors. We are more than conquerors. Paul is using strong, emphatic language to declare that not only will we win, but that it's absolutely impossible to lose. What does it mean to be more than a conqueror? Losing is not even possible. It's something that's not even on the table. And as we continue our study through the book of Romans, and as we find hope in the gospel, we will understand more and more what it means to be, to get up every day and to live our lives in the victory that Christ has given to us. And we're gonna be encouraged as we go through this. And so we're jumping right into the series today. Lesson one begins right here in chapter four. And lesson number one is this, fully persuaded faith. Fully persuaded faith. Now, I know it's been a couple weeks since we've been in the book of Romans, but three weeks ago when we left off in our series, remember everybody was out in the middle of the ocean and we were all drowning there is none righteous, no, not one. We are sinners and there's a penalty that's paid for our sin and we are going down and there's nothing that we can do about it. And then all of a sudden, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, justification without the law appears. And while we're swimming around, while we're drowning and while we're fighting for life, the life jacket, Jesus himself appears. And what we got to do is not just grab a hold of that life jacket, but put it on, put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ and we are saved and our lives are drastically changed. That's where we left off. Well, in chapter four, all that Paul's going to do is he's going to continue to build on this entire idea of justification. But his emphasis is going to be on the fact that justification is by faith. Faith is God's one and only way for salvation. There's no other way to be saved apart from putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. In this chapter, he's going to remind us that justification by faith is not a brand new idea. It's been around for a long time, and he's especially going to point that out to his Jewish audience, and he wants us all to understand, not just the Jews, but all of us as believers today, he wants us all to understand the rich spiritual heritage that we are a part of because of faith. And in order to help us do that, he's going to go all the way back to the beginning to Father Abraham. 
So Romans chapter four is a case study in the life of Abraham. Now, how many of you have had the wonderful privilege of growing up in church and you got to sing one of the greatest children's songs of all time, Father Abraham? Put your hand up if that's you. Man, look at all those people right there, right? So you know how that song goes? Father Abraham had many sons and many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord right arm. Let's all stand up and, no, just kidding. We're not gonna do that. For those of you who have not had the wonderful experience of singing Father Abraham, it probably is one of the most hated children's songs by a lot of workers because by the time you get done, you're doing your right arm, your left arm, your right foot, your left foot, you're spinning, you're twirling. You can add all kinds of extra stuff in there, high fives, closing your eyes, turn around, and then you sit down and everybody's completely forgot about what we're singing about. But as I was studying this passage today, I was reminded in that simple song, there's some absolutely incredible truths. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. Guess what? I am one of them. By faith, I'm one of them. And if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, so are you. So let's all praise the Lord for the wonderful truths. The goal of my message today is that when we get to the end of the service, before we leave, you all are gonna ask and beg that we sing Father Abraham because of the, no, okay, I know that's not gonna happen. But the point is, when we get done, we all should be praising the Lord for the wonderful heritage of faith that we get to be a part of. So let's just jump right into this this morning. The first thing I want us to see, fully persuaded faith simply believes. Fully persuaded faith simply believes. What is it about Abraham? Look at what Paul says in verse one. He says, what shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? Paul's asking a great question. What, what is it about Abraham? What is it about Abraham that has made him one of the most revered men in all of human history. By the way, Abraham is looked to as the father of three faiths that, by the way, are front and center on the world stage today as we speak. Does anybody know what those three faiths are? Go ahead and call them out. One of the faiths is? Judaism. Okay, Judaism. There we go. I was expecting a, a, a smattering. Judaism is one of the faiths. What's another one? Islam, Islam is another one. And the last one is? Christianity, that's exactly right. Well, what was it that Abraham found? And this is where Paul's going. We're just going to get right to the heart of the matter. What was it that Abraham found that both the Jews and the Muslims miss out on? What's, what's, this, what's the truth about him? Look at what he says in verse 2. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory. But what are those last four words? But not before God. It definitely wasn't his works that he found. And by the way, as, as far as works go, you're not going to find a man that could be looked up to and honored for his faith and for his obedience more than Abraham. He's revered. I mean, he did one of the most ultimate acts of obedience. He was willing to offer his own son Isaac up on the altar because he had faith that no matter what happened, God was still in control. He could bring him back. But the point is, he was willing to follow God to the extreme lengths, even to the offering of his own son. As far as works go, Abraham's incredible. And you know what the reality is? If he was justified by his works, he would have something to boast about, especially if his works were being compared with our works. If you look around at other human beings, you're always gonna find somebody that you can say, I'm a little bit better than they are. But how did that verse end in verse two? But not before God. The idea that we would, would ever have anything to boast about before God is preposterous. He builds on this in verse four. We're not gonna take the time to read it, but in verse four, he explains further that if you work for something, it's no longer grace, it's no longer a gift, it's a payment, it's something that you've earned. When your employer gives you a paycheck, they're not giving you a gift, they're giving you what you've earned, what you contract it for when it comes to work. And the entire idea that he's trying to build right here at the, at the beginning is that the idea that we could ever boast before God or the idea that we could ever put God in a position where he owes us something is preposterous. It's simply inconceivable and unbelievable. So what is it that Abraham found? Look at what verse three says. 
I love this, by the way, the first part's a great answer. Answer, for what saith the scripture? Best place to look for the right answers is God's word. And that's what Paul does. He goes, what, what saith the scriptures? If you're not gonna believe me, believe what God's word says. Back in Genesis 15, verse six, it says, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. You know what Abraham had that's so amazing? He had faith. That's what he discovered. That's what he found. That's different from everybody else. It wasn't his works. It wasn't anything that he could do. It was just the fact that he simply believed God. Guess what happened in Abraham's life? I don't know how it happened, but at some point God came to him. Abraham was about 70 years old and God came to him and said, hey, Abraham, I'm gonna make you the father of a great nation. I'm gonna give you a land. I'm going to bless you through you. All the nations of the world are going to be blessed. And do you know what Abraham did? He said, okay, God, I believe you. I'm gonna trust you. Now, that, that in and of itself to me, that, that promise, those commands that he's given, those are astronomical. Those, those feel unbelievable. And Abraham simply believed God. And because he believed God, an amazing exchange happened in his life. A sinful man who grew up in idolatry was now righteous before God by faith, by simply believing. Verses five through eight, they go on and they expound on this amazing exchange. Look what it says in verse five. It says, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without work, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Think about that verse, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Do you know what God has done? God has justified the ungodly. Who is ungodly? I am ungodly. You are ungodly. We are all ungodly. Here's the practical application. Accept the offer. Accept the offer. You may be sitting here this morning and you might be thinking, man, well, I didn't have quite the same experience, the unbelievable experience that Abraham had. I mean, God never showed up to me and promised that he was gonna make me the father of a great nation. Can I propose to you today that what we have in Jesus Christ, I believe is far greater than what even Abraham had? Do you remember that day when you recognized the fact that you were in sin? Do you remember the day where the full weight, the full reality that I am a sinner and that what's gonna happen to me after I die is I deserve wrath. I deserve to be separated from God for eternity in hell. That's the punishment that I've earned. That's the debt that I deserve because of my sin and because of my rebellion to God. Remember the full weight of it, that I can do nothing about it. But then all of a sudden you recognize Jesus and what he did for you on the cross. Can I tell you that God hath appeared to you through his word and he extended an incredible offer that the only way that you can receive it is by faith. Go ahead and take out your communion elements this morning. I want you to go ahead and, and get the bread. The little wafer that's on the top. The phenomenal thing is that God loved us enough that he sent his son, Jesus, who came to this earth and he became a man. And at the end of his life, he went to a cross and his body was broken and his blood was shed. But hours before he went to that cross and hours before he went to that suffering, he was sitting around a table with his disciples, with his followers at the last supper. And what did Jesus do at the last supper? Go ahead and put Matthew 26, verse 26 up on the screen. I mean, put yourself here in this moment. It says, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and he blessed it and gave it to the disciples and break it. He blessed it and then he break it and gave it to the disciples and said, what's that next verse? Take, eat, this is my body. Do you understand 
that Jesus came and he has extended to you an incredible offer that you don't deserve. And he said, I came to this earth and I became a man and I took on flesh and my body was broken and it was bruised and nails were put into my hands and into my feet and I suffered a horrible death and I did it all for you. And all you gotta do is take. That's what faith is. It's accepting the offer. This morning, before we move any further, I want us to just pause for a minute and just to reflect on what this means. Salvation changes everything. When Paul said at the beginning, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation. Yes, that starts the moment you receive the offer, but it continues every single day of our life. Whatever we're faced with in life, even our own sin and our own flesh, God is constantly transforming us and saving us from sin and death and this world and all the things that come with it. If we trust him by faith and we walk in that faith, Here's what I want you to do. I just want you to bow your head for just a minute. I I want you, the Bible tells us before we partake of the Lord's Supper, we need to do this seriously. I want you just to take a minute and examine your heart and examine your life and realign it with who Jesus is and what he did for you on the cross. In just a minute, I'm going to pray. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never believed in Jesus. Maybe you can't remember that specific time where the full weight of your sin hit you. Can I tell you that you're born into this world as a sinner and on the cross, Jesus died and he's extending to you through his body and through his blood. He's extending to you salvation. He's extending to you a relationship. He wants to make you a child of God. And all you have to do is believe, take his body, take his blood. You can believe in your heart right now. At the end of the service, we'll give you a chance to talk to somebody about that. But if that's you and you don't know for sure, just believe that Jesus died for your sins and you can be saved. Father, I thank you for this bread and what it represents. And I thank you for your body that was broken for us upon the cross. Lord, I thank you that in spite of our sin and the fact that there's absolutely nothing we could ever do about it, you gave your life so that we could be saved. Lord, by faith, thank you that we could receive this gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Bible tells us that as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take, eat, this do in remembrance of him, in remembrance of him. What did Jesus say in Matthew 26, verse 27? I want you to go ahead and put that up there on the screen. It says, and he took the cup and he gave it to them saying, and he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. Not only did he pass his body around the bread, But then he also took the cup and he said that this is going to be a reminder of the blood that was shed for the remission of our sins. Here's what I want you to do before we take this this morning. Will you just bow your head and thank God for the unspeakable gift that he gave us on the cross? Father, I thank you for this cup and what it represents. I thank you for the blood that you willingly shed on the cross so that we could be saved. Lord, I pray that we would never get over that moment of faith. Lord, I pray that we would never get over the moment where you appeared to us personally. And you said, I've given, I, 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 my body was broken and my blood was shed so that you could be saved, so that you could have a relationship with me. Lord, I thank you that by faith we can receive this gift and that our life has been forever changed as a result of it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians that when he had given thanks, after the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. In remembrance of him. I just want to end this first point 
with verse 8 of chapter 4, and it says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. The Lord doesn't count our sin against us. He counts his righteousness for us. And all God's people say, amen, amen to that. I hope, we never, I hope we never move too far past the simple faith that it takes to be saved and the wonderful transformation that has happened and taken place in all of our hearts and all of our lives because of what Jesus did. Fully persuaded faith simply believes. Secondly, though, Fully persuaded faith sees clearly. Look at what it says in verse 9. Paul's going to ask some big questions here. Now, now that we understand that, that it, was his right, it was his faith that made him righteous, he says in verse 9, Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the cir- uncircumcision also? He's asking, is, is faith only for a select few? Is it only for the, the Jewish people, or is it for everybody in all the world? Then he goes on in verse 10 and he says, how was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Then Paul comes and asks an even, even bigger question. When was Abraham made righteous? When did his faith change everything? Was it, was it when he was circumcised? Was it the act of circumcision that saved him? Or was he made righteous before he was circumcised, when he was in uncircumcision? And the answer was, his faith made him whole. His faith made him righteous when he was in uncircumcision. And in fact, there was a period of about 14 years, at least, that separated the promise when he believed God and when the sign and the seal came of circumcision. And so this is huge. You might be wondering, well, why does this matter? Why is this such a big deal? couple practical applications here. Number one is this. Faith is for all. Fully persuaded faith sees clearly that faith is for all. Look at what he says at the end of verse 11. It says, he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that the righteousness might be imputed unto them also. The reason why Abraham was justified by faith in his uncircumcision was to prove to the fact that to the entire world, the only acceptable act of the human heart that is available to every people, kindred, tribe, tongue, nation, is faith in Jesus Christ. There is nothing physically that you need to do to be saved. There is nothing physically that you can do to be saved. All you got to do is simply believe. Fully persuaded faith sees that. Hey, that's why our church has such an emphasis on missions. That's why people like my brother Dan was here last week and why he's willing to leave the comforts of America behind and go to a country and a nation like Madagascar because you know what? There are people there that are lost and drowning and dying in their sin, but the righteousness of God is available to them. And what better way to live your life than to extend the good news of Jesus Christ that's available to all to take up your cross, to follow Jesus so that other people can experience what we experience in Christ fully persuaded faith sees clearly doesn't just see that faith is for all but it also tells us that we should walk in that faith when we see clearly we walk in that faith look at verse 12 i love this and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father abraham you know what that verse is telling us that the same righteousness that was imputed to Abraham by faith can be ours if we walk in that faith. Well, what's the faith that he walked in? Here's here's the beautiful reality. Guess what happened? God came and he made all those unbelievable promises to Abraham. And then what did he say to do? He said, get you out of your country, leave your family behind and go to this new country, go to this new land, go to the promised land and follow me. And you know what Abraham did? He obeyed, but he obeyed after he put his faith in God. It didn't just stop there. He doesn't just show up to us, extend the gift of salvation, and then just leave us on our own to figure life out. No, he says, I have a plan, and I have a purpose, and I've given you instructions, and here's the faith that we walk in. We believe God, and then we do what he says. First, faith 
then signs and seals come as a result. The problem is, guess what? We get this backwards. There are so many believers There are so many Christians in our world today that are looking for signs and seals more than they're looking to be obedient to the truths of God's word. And here's the reality. Because we are not people of the word, you know what we do? We look to our circumstances. We look to our emotions. We look for the miraculous. We look for signs in the day. Because I saw this, maybe this is supposed to happen. Can I tell you, it's not that complicated, folks, and it doesn't work that way. We believe God. We believe that Jesus died for us. And then we have this book that's full of promises, that's full of commands. And when we get up every day and we trust and we obey and we believe as we walk with God, then the sign and then the seals come. As he puts his stamp of approval, as he fills us with his spirit and his power, as his promises come to fruition in our lives, that's the faith that we must walk in. Here's the Here's a very practical application for this point. I want you just to take a minute, just again, just to think about what promise is it that you need to claim or what command is it that you need to obey? The thing is, if we're not coming here today fully understanding what our next step is or, and I'm not even gonna go down that road. I'm just gonna say this. I believe this with every bit of my heart. Every one of you know what you're faced with in life right now. You know what your trials are. You know what your temptations are. You know where you're at. Well, what promise does God have for you today in the battle that you're in? Or what command does God have for you to be obedient to? What is it that you know you're not doing that you should be doing? I want you to, I want you to write that down. I want you to take this personal. Because you know what fully persuaded faith does? It sees clearly. It walks in the truths of God's word. And it's obedient to the truths of God's word. And when you do that, I promise you, God's going to show up. And he's going to tell you what's next. And he's he's going to show you that he is real and that he is at work. And that he's changing your life in every good way. What, What command do you need to obey? What promise do you need to believe? And that leads me to my last point this morning, which is this fully persuaded faith guarantees promises. You ready for some really exciting and good news? All right. I need everyone sitting up straight and tall, listening and paying attention. We're going back to children's church this morning. I got candy if you're doing good. You know what I have plenty of? I have plenty of peanut M&Ms. I have gotten showered with peanut M&Ms. I'm not going to pass out candy if you're listening, but listen, you don't want to miss this last point. There's some incredible truths here. Look at verse 13. Fully persuaded faith guarantees promises. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. That he should be the heir of the world. The ultimate promise that was given to Abraham was a messianic promise. And you know what the reality is? I just got to, I got to just touch on this for just a minute. When we're talking about guaranteed promises, what he gave to Abraham and what he gave to his seed after him was a promise that is absolutely guaranteed and is absolutely sure. And I don't know how this particular war is going to play out in the nation of Israel, but I know this, when it's all said and done, the nation of Israel will stand. There's absolutely no way that it will not stand because God has promised emphatically that he's got something incredible that he wants to do through his people. And then on top of that, all those who put their faith and trust in Jesus, who follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, are heirs of this world. Because of what Jesus Christ did, not only are we saved, but one day we will literally inherit this earth. One day all of the pain and troubles and problems of this life are going to be over. Is anybody wondering today... How in the world, though, did we get from a promise of the land and that all the world would be blessed through his seed to an heir of the world? How did we get that far? I don't know if I ever remember reading that particular phrase in the book of Genesis in chapter 15 or some of the other passages. Do you know how we get there? God always wants to do exceeding abundantly above anything that we could ever ask or think. Fully persuaded faith doesn't just believe in the promises of God, doesn't just believe that they're going to come to fruition, but believes that we will see God do far beyond what we are humanly capable of even comprehending. That's 
what Paul's going to drive home here at the end of this. And he does it by saying this, faith and grace equals guaranteed promises. Faith and grace equals guaranteed promises. Now he's reiterating, look at verses 14 and 15. He's reiterating one more time that that's not what the law does. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. Um, He's saying if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on a promise. It's, it's based on a guarantee. It's based on a debt. But no, God has given us a promise because look what he says. Okay, I knew I was in the wrong spot. It was somehow, I sw- man, when I picked up my Bible and got excited, it went back to chapter two because I was like, that is not the right verse. <laughs> it says in verse 14, for if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of none effect. Okay, so the There's a promise. There's not obedience. There's no debt. There's just a simple promise. And then he says in verse 15, because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. But guess what? There's the law that's in God's word. There's the law that's written in our hearts. We are all condemned and we are all guilty. So just like the righteous are going to inherit the earth, the unrighteous are going to inherit the wrath of God for all eternity. Ultimately, that's going to end up in a very real place called the lake of fire, where there will be eternal torment and suffering for all eternity. This is serious business. But faith and grace guarantee the opposite, because look what he says in verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end that the promise might be, what's that next word? Sure. Let's say that out loud together. The promise might be Sure, to all the seed. God's telling us that when he makes a promise, it's guaranteed. And the way that it's guaranteed is by faith through grace. And here's what we're talking about. Grace gives freely what we could never earn, what we could never deserve. Grace gives us eternal life. Grace makes us heirs of the promise. And the only acceptable human response is faith. And you know what that means? Faith accepts promises that absolutely cannot be broken because they are given to us by God's sheer grace alone and they are based on who he is, not on who we are. Let that sink in. Faith accepts promises that cannot be broken. Fully persuaded faith guarantees the promises of God. You know what you were just thinking about a minute ago with the commands and with the promises? They are absolutely guaranteed. And you might be sitting here thinking, well, that sounds a little bit too good to be true. Maybe you're just a little bit skeptical this morning. Maybe life's been beating you up pretty bad lately. Well, look at verse 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God. Who did Abraham believe in? God. Who did Abraham believe in? God. And what does God do? He quickens the dead. You know what that means? God makes the dead come to life. What happened to Jesus on the third day? He rose again from the grave. The grave has no power. The grave has no grip. The grave has no hold on God. God is greater and bigger than death, and he can make dead come to life, which is exactly what he did in our hearts when we put our faith and trust in Jesus. And then look at what else he says at the end of verse 17. And calleth those things which be not as though they were. You know what this is talking about? Creation. What's God able to do? He's able to make something out of nothing. He said, let there be light and there was light. He said, let there be trees and there was trees. He's able to create. And just in case we don't think that God can guarantee our promises, just remember that he can raise the dead. Just remember that he can make something appear out of nothing. By grace, through faith, our promises are guaranteed. So here's the last practical application. We are done. Give God glory. Give God glory. That's what Abraham's life did. Look at verse 18. Who against hope believed in hope. Man, if you got, your, if you got a highlighter, an underliner, these are things you cannot miss. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Does anybody remember how old Abraham was when I said that God initially came to him? He was 70, which means that Sarah was about 60 He was already past childbearing years. Any of you ladies want to give birth at 60? 
No, it's already impossible. And he believed God. And guess what? It was 29 years later, 30 years later, when God shows up to him again. And look at verse 19. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old. He can't give life. There's no life coming from him. This man's 100 years old. And he said, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Look at verse 20. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. You want something powerful to sink into your heart and life this morning? Abraham was a hundred years old. His wife was 90. His body was dead. Her body was dead. But he staggered not in unbelief. Because God showed up and said, Abraham, I'm going to give you a son and I'm going to give it through your wife, Sarah. And guess what God did? He delivered on his promise and he created life where there was death and he created something out of nothing in an impossible situation because that is who our God is. You want to give glory to God this morning? You want to live in a way that shows the proper respect to what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross? Be people of the word and get in this book and claim the promises and obey the commands and live it out every day and stagger not in unbelief and be fully persuaded that whatever he says, he's going to deliver. Because this wasn't just written for his sake only, but for ours. Man, the way... That we continue to glorify God through our life is with fully persuaded faith. And God give us Christians. God give us believers that grab a hold of the truths. And it doesn't matter if you're faced with cancer. It doesn't matter if you're still grieving the loss of a loved one. It doesn't matter what's going to happen tomorrow that might completely and totally rock your world. Whatever it is that we go through, there are truths and promises in God's word that will meet your needs, that will fuel your heart, that will satisfy your soul, that will strengthen you, that will give you peace that passes all understanding. And no matter how desperate it seems, don't be weak in faith, but be strong in a God who is more than able to deliver You want to make a difference in our world today? Live a life of fully persuaded faith because I promise you God will show you some signs and seals. He'll prove to this world that there's something different about you and it's Jesus that's living inside of you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. The challenge is simple this morning. We were singing about leaning on the everlasting arms a little bit ago. And I love that song, and that's a powerful truth. But I I think there's even a little bit more than that sometimes. I don't think we just need to lean on those everlasting arms. I think we need to jump totally and completely into his arms to say goodbye to the things that are causing us to fear and doubt and worry and just jump by faith into God's arms, into who he is. Because you know what he'll do? He's gonna hold you fast. And he'll strengthen you and he'll encourage you no matter where you're at today.